Hello, and welcome to the Client Experience Revolution. I'm your host, Raya Gonzalez, and I am joined today with Michelle Cooper of Alchemy Accounting and Bookkeeping. Welcome. Thank you so much, Raya. I am so excited to talk to you today. We are going to dive into some juicy financial stuff. And you may not think that finances are juicy. I do. And that's what this is really about is what's important to me. So, <laughs> right? No, but in all seriousness, Michelle is a powerhouse entrepreneur. She's the CEO of Alchemy and Accounting and Bookkeeping. She's the author of several books, one of which I literally just ordered on Amazon right before we started recording. Um, so, check out Confessions of a Money Rockstar your money date journal. And she also co-authored the collaborative book, Women Rising. Michelle, tell us about a little bit more about your business, how you got here, what's your story and how you serve people. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Well, I think that I've always been a little bit of a rebel. And so that ends up being my client, right? My ideal client. Uh, I didn't kind of follow the traditional route um, after university, and I went into strategic growth for a lot of really large companies like Citibank, PricewaterhouseCoopers, um, large restaurant chains like TGI Fridays. Um, And that gave me some really great understanding of review and analysis uh, of of like big business, right? then, of course, uh, you know, I spent some time off the grid, traveling, experiencing life, had kids, kind of came back. Uh, I live in the West Coast of Canada now and uh, saw that I had friends who had businesses that weren't making any money and they could not understand what was going on. They had lots of people coming in their businesses and they just never had enough money in the bank for all of the bills, let alone to pay themselves. And what I realized is that that's a really common experience. And it actually was an experience that had happened in my own family and I didn't even realize. And so I, I really got clear on who I wanted to help. Like I wanted these people to feel successful. And so I started helping them. Now, over the course of, you know, that kind of evolution, I started my own business. Originally, I had a little kind of boutique. I played roller derby. I offered really fun and funky things. That became like my biggest nightmare. Like my my biggest passion became my biggest nightmare. Um, I ended up closing the store, but it was such a gift because it gave me a real true to life understanding about what my clients go through every day. So true. And I think that this is the part that people don't talk about. And that is in startup and people who are in startup, you need to understand that it's not just that you can, that the statistically speaking, that the three to five years for success rate or whatever, it's that you often can't pay yourself, you know, and if you don't have it set up right, Um, And even when you do have it set up right in the beginning, there are so many things going out that you can't pay yourself. So you have to be set up really strategically to start a business and ideally have a nest egg, you know, where you can pull from to take care of your basic expenses, because what happens is you're constantly behind at that point. And I'm really grateful that I have a partner. Because, um, and even with having a partner, it was a shit show because I didn't take an income for a full 18 months. I took no income. So we went from two full-time robust incomes. We don't make millions, but we were both, you know, in our late thirties, um, or early forties. And so we'd put in our time and then to one income, but really one income draining away from the other income because I had no, um, I had, well, first of all, no fucking clue what I was doing. Second of all, I, um, I didn't have that little nest egg. And so what I thank you so much for bringing that up because 
there is this like um, glamorous um, opinion of entrepreneurship when the reality of what you're doing when you're opening a business, and I'm not saying don't open a business. Like if you are an innovator, if you have an idea, if you are solving a problem and you're the only person with the answer to that problem, by God, answer that problem, like open that business, but be smart, like engage the people who know and have walked in front of you and have made the mistakes for you. And so that you can do it with a bang, you know, so thank you for bringing that up. Totally. Like my, that little boutique, I basically opened on my credit cards and, and that's, that's awesome. Right. That I had the credit available, but I was drowning um, in debt. And, you know, I can remember um, days where we'd have no sales, like zero, like nothing. And I'm like, what? How do I get people in here? And then, you know, we had some kind of like big box stores open up in our town and people were all excited, you know, like Target and Winners and all this kind of stuff. And, They're going off there to buy their, you know, whatever it was. And, and how do you compete with that? Right. There was so many things going on. And before I knew it, it, it took a toll on my personal life. You know, I was a mom of three young kids, took a toll on my marriage. Um, I was so stressed about cash flow that I ended up just saying, and then of course it was a retail store. So I had shoplifters. Right. Yeah. So now people are trying to steal from you. And then um, it was just one incident, which which just kind of took me over the edge where um, a girl was trying to steal like something stupid, like a candle or something. And I was like, look, I know you got that in your pocket. Just put it back. Like, I just I'm not interested in having this happen. And she tried to stab me with a hypodermic needle. Oh, my God. Yeah. And I was like, I closed the door. I actually pushed her out. Like I played roller derby. I'm not, I was a pretty tough chick, right? Yeah. But I pushed her out the door. I closed the door. I locked it and I never opened the store again. I was like, that's it. I'm done. Yeah. Like I'm just not willing to take that chance. Right now I had to crawl out of a huge hole I had built huge, huge, like I'd say in total, probably $50,000 in debt and credit card debt, which was accruing incredible amounts of interest. So I had to learn how to negotiate debt, Mm. uh, which I hadn't done before because I had been hiding from debt in previous instances. And, and then I had to kind of like get off, like get to work. Like what can you do to make some money right now? Which is where I ended up helping friends understand their numbers. So it's kind of weird that I had created this giant mess on one hand, and then I was helping other people and they were getting great results. Right. So I just like kind of grinded it out, worked all the hours I could. And I, I helped a friend who had a cleaning business and I did house cleaning and, and like I was doing all these things, right. To get this debt paid off and try to like, fix my family, my marriage in this big mess I had made. And, and then I realized, oh, actually this is such a gift to me because I understand what so many people go through. Yes. And the real cost wasn't the credit card debt or the interest. The real cost was on my family and my marriage and my health. Yes. That was the huge cost. Yeah. And, and it, I don't know, like I, it's recovering now, but it took a lot. Right. Yeah. And so I was able to help these, you know, friends and, and, and people, you know, they would refer their friends and network. And all of a sudden I had, you know, at the ba- most basic level, they needed bookkeeping. Yeah. Right. They needed accurate information for me to help Which, them get the analysis. Pin right there. Everyone <laughs> who's listening Yes, you need a bookkeeper. You do. You cannot do this shit on your own. Right. You will pay now or you will pay later. Like right. <laughs> you will pay now in having a bookkeeper or you will pay later in a CPA cleaning up your crap. So here's the difference. 
The difference is you pay now and you pay a bookkeeper and your CPA costs you less because they have clean books, but you have valid information to make your business decisions throughout the, throughout the year, or you have no fucking clue what's happening in your business and you have a big ass mess to pass off to your CPA and then you pay out the rear end to your CPA. So bookkeeping is a necessity. Amen, sister. Like the amount of times I say to people, bookkeeping is the cheapest thing you can get with the highest ROI for you possible. Like there is no reason to even have this conversation. Just get a phenomenal bookkeeper. And keep interviewing people. Like find out who works for you. You know what I'm saying? Like for me personally, I had an amazing, like I actually had an awesome referral right off the bat, like somebody that they had been referring. I personally was, and I, and this is not for everyone. Um, but I trained somebody from the Philippines with my bookkeeper and then I had them working for me for a while and it didn't end up working out. And then I decided I was going to give it one more try. And I have a bookkeeper now who's in the Philippines. However, her full-time job is working for a company, a, a large company in California. And she has a small bookkeeping client in Florida. So she's extremely familiar with the U.S. And here's the things that benefit you from having a bookkeeper. She sends me a little message on Slack and she says, Hey, Raya, I noticed that you're keeping track of all your receipts, but you're not itemizing your sales tax. Do you want me to take care of that for you? And I'm like, stop it with your sexy words that you're saying. Right? <laughs> what? No one has ever asked me that before. Like, yes, please. That's amazing. Right? You know, but like, if you don't know what you don't know, You know, and so, and I have some weird things too, where I was like, I, and I've had like a meeting with my CPA because this is actually a new thing for my CPA too. Um, But my bookkeeper was able to figure it out. Um, I'm a notary. And so in the U S you have uh, this special, um, it's not a deduction, but it's a deduction off your self-employment tax where every time you do your notary stamp, you can take the amount that your state allows you to charge for that, but only off your self-employment tax. So I'm like, how the heck do we do this in QuickBooks? You know, whatever. She's like, oh, oh, it's fine. I got this. You know, it's totally fine. And I'm like, okay. You know, like, again, like you with your sexy words, like telling me that you could take care of my finances. Right. It's just that you, but again, like, that's not for everybody to hire out to the like an outsourcing. I actually really highly recommend that you do somebody locally, that you do somebody that understands your state's laws and uh, your state's, um, you know, regulations and the best ways for you to maximize your finances. And I know like you're in British Columbia, but you work with people all over the United States. You're very familiar with what their needs are going to be, you know, but people should um, feel that level like, like I do with my bookkeeper. Like you should feel like they're sharing information that is like, she might as well have said like that yellow top on you is clutch. Like everything that you, everything that's on your face. Yes. You know what I mean? But instead she talked about receipts and sales tax. Like, yeah. that's how you should feel about your bookkeeper is that you have this relationship where they're, they're giving, they're giving you info. They're giving you a power back in your, in your business. And it's Absolutely. not boring numbers on a line in a thing. It's information that helps you make informed decisions about how you're going to move forward, how you're going to succeed and yeah, I like, but if you don't feel that with the person, it's just like the orthodontist situation, like get another opinion and get another opinion and get another opinion and be like, you know what? That first one, that's who I resonated with the most. Okay. Go back to that first one. Yeah. Like we're not, we're not an ideal fit for everybody, right? Like yeah. uh, alchemy supports mission-driven entrepreneurs and specializes really in 
people who have a mess to clean up and then supporting them on an ongoing basis. Right. But we're, we're very um, casual kind of straight talking, like get your shit together. Um, we'll, we're here to support you, but we're not willing to put up with like crap. Right. So you got to mm-hmm. participate in the process and uh, like this is important. Like you need to pay attention, right? And and also we don't use we don't use all those complicated words that accountants use to justify high fees. <laughs> yes, I. So I. Um, true story. I won't name names because it's because they're in Washington or whatever. But I've used um, the same CPA firm for fifteen years. And I told you this, they had, I did not work directly with the CPA. I worked with the tax preparer. She had right. worked for him for 20 years and she was a, just a personality. Like she, she was somebody that I wouldn't have, you know, like, I don't know if we would have known each other or been friends outside of this setting, but we just like, you can't go to the same person for 15 years and sit down and look at all the stuff. And all the things that happened over 15 years. And we would bring our little kids and we would like do our whole thing. And then this whole situation happened and somehow she doesn't work there anymore. And I'm not sure like what the whole like story I didn't ask, but I was like, um, I'm not working with the CPA. I don't like him. Like I liked her. That's not for me. And so I asked for my, because I got a new CPA who was a referral and I'm super happy and, you know, all those kinds of things. But I, but she's like, you know, it'd be really, really helpful for me because we were late to do 2019 because of all the COVID stuff. She's like, I really need to see your 2018 and your 2017 because I have a home office. So she needed to see like the measurements, like how we claimed things before all that good stuff. And um, he charged me. $40 $40 for each of those years. And they were not cheap. Like this business was not cheap to begin with, but he that's charged ridiculous. me to get access to my own records. Yeah. I might ridiculous. as well have just pulled tax transcripts from the IRS is what I should have just done. But I just, I didn't, I just was so flabbergasted and I needed it quickly. I just was like, okay, I'll just do it. And, well, and plus she probably needed the working papers, right? Which yes. is what he would have given, but they're your records. They actually don't belong to him. And in I know. some places it's illegal to charge that fee to access your own records. No. Do you hear that person that I'm not going to say your name? You suck. <laughs> <laughs> you suck. And I'm not with you because you let go of the person that needed to be there. But Um, Okay, let's talk about COVID. Let's talk about this pandemic. Let's talk about, we have seen some of the weirdest, coolest, saddest things happen in business with finance due to the pandemic. So um, my, the business mentor that I've been working with over the last year, her name is Kelly O'Neill. And she says, and this, I know, I know this is not specific to her. I've heard it elsewhere, but it says, you know what's important to somebody by looking in their calendar and looking in their pocketbook. Right. How do they spend their time? How do they spend their money? And yeah. you're getting half and and actually probably a hint at most of the calendar too because you're seeing like when and where and how, why and how they're spending their money, but you're getting a good glimpse at how people are spending money. So let's talk about the pros and the cons of the pandemic. Like what's, what are the trends you're seeing with the people who are really succeeding and really their business is taking off with the pandemic. And let's talk about the people who are having a little bit more difficulty pivoting. Um, You know, they, um, you know, you know, the, this is just like really, really tanked. I mean, there's some obvious, obviously if you're a brick and mortar this has been devastating. If you're a brick and mortar that couldn't quickly pivot, like didn't have an online aspect of your business that couldn't pivot, that's like goes without saying. I'm talking about people who had the potential or who have the potential to succeed in the pandemic and like, and they're maybe not for some reason, or it's a, it's a lot slower of a process. What's the difference? Like what's, what are they doing in their finances 
um, that's different between between the two? So we have several brick and mortar clients, like hair salons is a big one that like took a hit. Hair salons and gyms took a, a pretty big hit, right? And many of them tried to pivot to like online or some kind of service or product sales just to kind of keep things going. Um, the ones that most um, kind of like survived, like that, that period where there was a, a complete shutdown, business can't open at all really um, looked at their expenses and took action right away. So for, for example, for yeah. our hair salons or our like wellness clinics or gyms, it was like, okay, what can you pause or turn off right now to stop the bleed kind of thing, right? And it was great because unlike any other time in history that we've had kind of like a downturn, everybody was in the same position. Right. So people, companies were really willing to pause things, right? Or, or you know, um, like I remember having this conversation with one of our gym owners and he was like, I'm trying to like stop the delivery of like the wipes, like the hygienic wipe things that they use. And he's like, and they won't, they won't pause the delivery because oh it has, it's like a certain amount of month. I'm like, just refuse delivery. There's nobody there. The business is closed. They cannot invoice you for what you're not receiving, right? And say to them, we're not open. So you can do what you want with that piece of information, but we're not open and we're not ordering supplies right now. For other businesses, it was looking at what what are they, um, like what recurring subscriptions do they have that maybe they could turn off is a really oh, yeah. good opportunity Big for one. a spending audit. I was just going to say that. And I think that this is more than I like literally even last night, because I had signed up for a free trial for um, a meditation app. It was, it was called, um, Oh, I forget. But anyways, a meditation app. And I want, I had put a little notation cause it was really expensive so I put a note on my calendar, cancel this app. You know what I mean? Like I really loved it, but not like $99 a year. Love it. And so it brought me to the subscription page on my iPhone. And I was like, I'm paying for that. Like there wasn't like a ton, but then I even was like, do I need Apple music? I have Spotify unlimited and Amazon music. Do I also need Apple music? Not yeah. really because I'm actually listening more on Spotify and Amazon. Like that's my been my go kind of go-to habit and so it's and then um in software too like um I have been like looking at um some things like I'm I'm kind of an app sumo junkie I don't know if you're familiar with app sumo mm -hmm. but it's like the groupon of softwares like yeah. and some of the stuff on there is like in beta so it's not quite ready and that's why it's being offered at a lifetime a membership but some of them like um Loom is a, is a tool that I use every day. Loom d is a screen recording tool. They've now re put a time limit of five minutes. And if you want more than five minutes, you have to upgrade to a subscription on a monthly basis. Well, AppSumo had for, I believe, $49, um, an app called BerryCast, which is the exact freaking thing with actually some pluses, you know what I mean? A couple minuses, meaning like their um, URL is a lot longer kind of thing and they have a little bit more branding. But I but I got it for $49 and I never pay again. And yeah. it's the same thing. So it's like, you, it allows you to kind of say like, and we should be doing that in our business, like looking at the software. And, I, and you know what I also did, which was surprising was, um, because we've had staffing changes and because we've made different changes in our expenses, I said, you know what? I want to go back to the project management software that we love and I want to pay for it. Mm -hmm. I want like, and, and the other thing too. So we use monday.com is yeah. our project management software is not, it is not cheap. Um, we were using free versions of other ones. And, um, but I decided that that was worth it to me. And I also decided that we upgraded our Slack membership because that was worth it to me. But it was like, these were 
knowledge based decisions because we were looking at the whole picture. Totally. What is, what are we spending? Not worth it. Not worth it. Not worth it. You know what? This one we're saving money, but we're, we're giving up functionality. Like, Mm -hmm. is that worth it? Yeah. That one, that one I think is actually worth it. Like, and it, it allowed me, whereas before I was being miserly and I was just like being, you know, like just kind of like, no, we got to go with the free option. We got to go with the free option where I was like, we use that every day. Like, yeah. why shouldn't we have what we really want if we're going to save money in these other aspects? And so when you say like really doing an audit, that's so important. Yeah. Like a spending audit is something I do with clients right from the start. Um, when they become a client, it's like, we're looking through all of the spending and seeing what it is. Cause often um, in fact, we can find their bookkeeping fee in in expenses that they don't use. So it's not actually costing them anymore to have bookkeeping because we can identify like what I call money leaks, where they're paying out for things that they don't use or don't value or they've forgotten about, right? And then I encourage clients to do that quarterly, like do a spending audit and look at what you're spending and classify it as like, I have to have this to do business. I like this and it's a convenience and it's worth it to me. And I don't use this. I don't even know what the fuck this is. Like get this off my books kind of thing. Absolutely. Take action from there. Do you, so there's always these questions too about like, So I use QuickBooks because my bookkeeper would only use QuickBooks. I was using Wave Apps, which is actually a Canadian app, which I friggin' love. And when, from a business standpoint, because I do some consulting, if somebody's starting out and they're going to try to do it on their own, I'm always like, just start with Wave because it's free. The user X is like really, really easy. But I know there's a lot of bookkeepers who don't want to use Wave. Like, so, and there's so many options, right? There's like, there's zero, there's fresh books, there's this, there's that. And, um, like my only resistance to QuickBooks is I get pissed every month when I pay the $21 or whatever. And I'm like, why are you like, to me, that's like, I, I mean, like I'll spend, I spent freaking $57 on a ring light to have it actually light my face. Right but $21 bothers me. (laughs) You know what I mean? Every month and that keeps my books right. But like, do you have an opinion or why are like bookkeepers and accountants so picky about like what, um, you know, like if somebody is starting out, like, do you agree that they should, for me, QuickBooks felt massive. It is kind of like the sales force of like, yeah. Um, so, so for me, as somebody just starting out, like where you maybe don't have as many transactions or something like that, that just felt like so much. But like, so, um, what if somebody's in the first couple years? What are your recommendations? What are the differences? Or like, you know, I mean, in terms of like, why? You know what I'm getting at. Yeah. Like I'm just ranting totally. at this point, but yeah. there's a yeah. lot of so, options, and it's hard to it's hard to know. Yeah, QuickBooks is probably is the number one, in my opinion, um, full suite bookkeeping software. Right. So I recommend it because it's very versatile. Right. It's a cloud based system. It has great functionality and it really can provide the level of detail that you need in your record keeping um, that is gonna give you like, like percentages of revenue, right? You can, you can do things like measure profitability on projects or specific clients, right? And that, that level of information is really, really important. You know, that's interesting because I have started using some of those features this year because I've had some additional help in the bookkeeping department. So one of the things that is a downfall for me and I know is a big downfall for other people is receipts. So I am a space cadet, like in the most lovable way. Um, But I have a hard time keeping track. And I, in 2019, I did an okay job of scanning them, but then they were like kind of all over the place. 
in like I have a drive called receipts 2019 in my Google drive, but it's like, you know, like there's no rhyme or reason. And so what I did for 2020 and what I'm continuing to do is I'm having whoever's helping me attach the receipt to the transaction. And then I do not think about that ever again. Like I delete that email. I get rid of that receipt. I don't think about it. It's attached to the transaction. If I get audited, booyah, like just check it out. You know what I mean? It's right there. Um, and so that's one of the things. And then also I, because I have an outsourced team. Um, so I don't have a traditional, I did have a W2 employee, which I used Gusto, Gusto or whatever. And that was, had an integration with QuickBooks, which is another kind of plug for QuickBooks, I guess. They have a lot of integrations. They do. Um, And so it literally dumped the information in the right categories for me. I didn't have to figure out which part goes where, which part goes where. It like literally dumped them in the right categories. And so it just made it easy for me that way. But I pay my employees by a program called TransferWise, which is like an alternative to like PayPal or any of those, because I pay the fees, it gets to them a lot faster. Um, And so when they show up in my QuickBooks, they just show up as TransferWise. Well, I want to know how much I'm paying each person. And so I have had my person set up each employee, their employees, but they're actually contractors, but they're not 1099 contractors. So you get like all this minutia. Um, And then I'm having them actually... um, categorize them by the person. So then I can say like, Pam, who's my ops manager, how much did I pay Pam this year? You know what I mean? Like, oh, okay, Jan, he's my podcast editor. How much did I pay John Marcel this year? And so there are these, there are these benefits to having a program that is a little bit more robust when you have the help where you can do that. But if you're trying to run a business and grind it out and you're not having the help, which is why Michelle and I are saying to everyone who is listening, bookkeeping is a necessity, not a luxury. It is Absolutely. the first thing that you put on your team, whether that be in-house, you know, like whether that be somebody um, that you get by referral, Michelle, outsource, whatever it might be. Although outsource, you need to talk to me because that is a very sticky situation. So that would be somebody you would need a VA matchmaker for. Um you know, because it's not, it's, it does have to be the exact right person. The ideal is that it would be somebody North America based, you know, that it would be like U S Canada. So they have like a um, real good grasp on what is affecting you. But one, I didn't even realize that my bookkeeper would take care of my quarterly taxes for me. Like she paid them for me. She would go into my department of revenue account and get the information for me. She's like, okay, Ryan, your taxes are due. It's X number of dollars. I'm just going to go ahead and pay that for you. And I was like, what? Like, this is so exciting. (laughs) One less thing I don't have to think about. It's just so important. Yeah. And And there's lots of, there's lots of moving pieces to a business. Right. And, um, there's all these little things that we have to keep track of you know, like quarterly taxes, um, maybe sales tax, payroll tax, like there's all these things that we have to stay in compliance with. And so that's why we need systems and processes and structure. Yes. And I'm lucky because I'm in Washington state and we have no state tax. Mm -hmm. Like imagine and take to the next level people in like almost every other state in the, in the lower 48, they all have, I mean, there's like, I think there's only I don't know for a fact, so don't quote me, but I think there's only like two or three of us that don't have state tax. Yeah. And so you have that extra layer on there where it's there, it's complex, you know, and it's not like, unless you're a bookkeeper yourself, you didn't go into business to do this. So it's, no. it's really important. Um, so I want to get to um, the next part, which is really mindset. And one of the things that drew me to you as a guest was you talk about the blame in finances, the financial blame and um, and how the mindset can either really propel you or can really, really um, draw you down. 
Um, and you were talking about how people are obsessed with sales. Let's chat about that. Yeah. So I call it the salesman or salesman's approach to business, right? So when you think about salesmen, they're really, really hyper-focused on the sale, right? Like the revenue number, because of course they get paid commission based on that, that, um, that number, right? Now, when we're in business, um, we don't have a business unless we have sales. So that's a really important piece to remember. This movement out there of um, six-figure business, seven-figure business, and, and that's the top line number. And I have seen so many people who are so focused on that top line number that they don't consider all the rest of the numbers. And the most important number is the profit. It does not matter how much your revenue is. It's your profit that matters because that's what you get paid, right? Like that's what, that's what's left for you. And so I tend to tell people like it's revenue minus profit equals what you can spend in expenses. And you can reverse engineer that to figure out how much revenue you need, right? But when you're so focused on the revenue and you don't consider everything else, uh, what can happen is, is that you don't have any um, money to pay yourself, right? And yeah. that, that's a really dangerous place to be in because then you start to build resentment towards your business, this thing, this thing that you loved so much and that you felt so passionate about doing and that was the be-all, end-all for your life, right? And now you resent it because you don't get paid because you're so focused on generating revenue, right? Now, revenue is important. So like, I'm not saying that you shouldn't think about revenue, but more importantly, it's a profit. And we see a lot, like we work with a lot of coaches and consultants and, um, and we often see that before they've had really great record keeping, they don't understand their pricing and the profitability of their pricing of their programs and services. And so often their, their pricing is actually not profitable because of other things that they have operating within their business, like client fulfillment contractors or um, like a big one for coaches is affiliate fees, right? Like you see these, oh, I did a six figure launch. Well, more often than not, 50% of that goes to affiliate fees right off the top. So now it's not a six-figure launch. It's a three-figure launch, right? And then you've yeah, got fulfillment absolutely. costs on the back end. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, that's the bottom line too. I, I always tell people like this COVID for me was, it wasn't, it was a mindset shift in the biggest of ways for me and my business really, really responded well. And like the high point was that I was on vacation in Mexico, which we had put off twice, but we decided to go this summer and I closed two clients, two or three clients. And I hit six figures all while on vacation. That's and, awesome. but I didn't hit six figures. Right. The business hit six figures and the business didn't hit six figures. The top line hit six figures. Totally. So while it was super fucking sexy to see that number, the reality is that I made by uh, Jan or excuse me, by July, which I don't care. Like I put my shit on blast. I don't care. Like I'm still two and a half years in, I'm still in startup, but I had made like $45,000, but like still like pre-business, that was good money. Like, you know what I mean? I was making probably, um, you know, making 50 to $55,000 a year. And I had made more, but in the business that I was in prior to being in business, so like to be in July and to hit like $40,000, $45,000, that was pretty damn good money. But it's like people are all obsessed with the six figures and it's like, what is your real number? 
Yeah. That's like, that's why, like, I'm pretty sure the episode to this podcast is why the top line doesn't matter at all. Like it yeah. really doesn't. doesn't it matter. is what is in your frigging pocket. Yeah. What is in your pocket? What is in your employee's pocket? What are you actually adding value to? You know, who are you supporting? What are the organizations that you're supporting that you're able to give back to because you have earned this money? You know, like the top line is just for, um, I was going to say it in Spanish. There's a word like, it means like luxury, lujo. It means like luxury. The top line is just for show, Mm -hmm. you know, like, It's just what you made, which go you. That means the possibility is there that you can cut your your expenses and you could put more of that money in your pocket. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Like you have to get creative. You have to be very innovative. And it depends on the type of business that you have. Like if you have, like I'm a service-based business. So my biggest expense are my people. You know what I mean? Like my actual, like, humans that help me do what I do. But if you had a product-based business, there's only some control you have over what your inventory costs, Yeah, you know? And so that that's where it really, like, I love what you talk about because people need to understand like, yes, revenue, 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 revenue. Sales is absolutely crucial. If you are not closing sales, you are not in business. But what, what do you do with that revenue? Right. What do you do with that? If you're not doing the right things, then you end up 50 some thousand dollars in debt because, you know, and I'm like, I'm not, I'm not shouting you out. I'm shouting me out. I'm shouting many, oh, many, like hundreds of thousands of people who, you know, we just, you know, I've had you know, friends and family members who have had to declare bankruptcy because they were like a hundred thousand dollars in debt after their business. Well, because they just, the rent was too high and, you know, and they, they couldn't afford staff. So they had to work themselves from open to close in the business. And they had small children, you know, and they're doing all the right things, but it just doesn't come together And that's when you have to get that kind of support, whether that be mindset support, accounting and bookkeeping support, Um, read the freaking book that we're about to talk about support. You know, like um, these are things that are very common, but are not spoken about. They are not talked about because it feels like if you say, you know, somebody may judge me because I just said that I only made 40 grand, you know, I mean, basically, fuck you. If you judge me, like, fuck right off. But um, <laughs> like, that's fine. But the the bottom line is like, this is COVID. And I'm my business made 100 grand and I put 40 of that in my pocket. Yeah. In the middle of a pandemic, I feel pretty freaking fantastic about that. And I was able to make informed decisions because before COVID hit, I realized that bookkeeping was a deficit for me. Mm -hmm. It was something I could do by myself, but I couldn't do it very well, very quickly. And there were a lot of moving pieces that once you got to the taxes and the quarterlies and the like beyond the basic deductions, I mean, like my first thing I did when I went into business, you'll laugh at this. I went to the library And I got two books and it was like every deduction you can take as a small business owner. And I flagged the whole thing. Like (laughs) I went through with sticky notes because to me, taking a deduction was like the doing the right thing. And sometimes taking the deduction is the not doing the right thing. Sometimes don't freaking spend the money. Who cares if it's deductible? Don't spend the money. Because you don't need to. Have you seen that with your clients? Oh, totally. Totally. You know, I call it um, borrowed from a mentor of mine, the entrepreneur's carousel, right? Like constantly looking for the next thing, the next fix, the next course, the next person, the next coach, the next program, the ne- like the next, right? The next software, the, the next thing. And so they um, spend a lot of money on that stuff and not, it's not always um, 
not always the best spend of the money, right? When you're reactionary and you're desperate. So it's important to understand, like, where are you making these decisions from? One, do you have accurate, detailed financial information that is telling you if you can afford this even, or, um, or you have money to pay for it, or have you run the numbers to see what the ROI would be, right? And two, yeah, absolutely. like, are you making the decision from a needy, um, fearful, energetic place? Like that, the mindset of fear um, is very reactionary. And, and if you've got that needy energy going on, then that's what you're going to like manifest or that's what you're going to experience, right? Um, yes. When we, when we are, when we're in a powerful state, we, we are clear on our goals. Like we have that level of clarity. Um, we understand where we're going. We've got accurate information from our financial records and we're not in a fearful place. Then we can make informed decisions about the next step. Now there may be a direct ROI for something. There may not be a direct ROI. That's not, it doesn't matter necessarily, but when you're, that's a different decision than the desperate, um, frantic kind of decision of I've got to fix this thing, right? And and that's what I, you know, like that's kind of like the downfall of, of COVID really um, for many people was like this frantic, oh my God, I've got to do something. And for mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. many, like, well, for all of my clients, my message was do nothing. Yes. Like just, pause. Do not do anything. Of course, have a look at where you're spending money and turn some things off. Do not do anything right now because you're not in the right state of being to be making these decisions, right? Exactly. Well, and I yeah. think there's probably people who didn't have a Michelle and who aren't in business today because they knee jerked to try to recorrect and repivot and they weren't able to recover from yeah. that. You know, yeah. it's just shocking to me. The, um, and I like have had to basically turn off news for myself because um, I, we won't get political, but, um, but <laughs> the, like just the amount of information that is um, politicized and, you know, good, bad, whether that be about, you know, our government or about um, the economy, I just have to say, like, how is the economy affecting me personally? What is my personal economy look like? Totally. Like, what is happening in my bubble? What is happening with the people that I love or the people that I share my business experience with? What's real for them? You know what I mean? And how do I base my business decisions off of what feels really good? Like what like feels really good? And like, for example, I'm in a, a business incubator program that I still have access to for three more months. And I paid in full for that program. And I met somebody who I met through the same person that you and I met. And she is an executive coach. And the minute I met her, I knew that we had to work together. Mm -hmm. I knew that she was the answer to the next step for me. That's but great. it wasn't from a fearful place. It was like, oh, my home is with you. You know what I mean? Like, oh, you, you are going to lead me to my next steps. Like, you have the right level of accountability and um, cheerleadership and um, business acumen because she's, you know, open and sold like four businesses and has this just like huge breadth of experience and like is now the right time to be investing in another coaching program when I'm already freaking in a coaching program that I have access to. Maybe on paper, no, but you have to go from a loving space. And it's not even like um, some of those things you don't know the ROI, right? Like you, you're, okay. you're, you don't know, but it, and you have to really 
really do a gut check. And is this coming because it's an, an energetic thing or is this the, like, I just really want this thing. Totally. You know what I mean? And so like, I, um, I told her like when we did our podcast, when we were in our green room and stuff, and I was like, um, we're working together, but I thought it was like March, you know what I mean? And I thought it would be an, a, like a one-to-one thing. And then there was a day where like some stuff happened with the program that I'm in. And I was just like, why am I waiting? Yeah. Like now is the time. Like this is, we're moving into 2021. Like I'm repivoting my business. Like there is like so much abundance in the world. Like I'm not in a desperate place with my business. You know what I'm saying? Like, why am I waiting? And so I just messaged her and I said, like, can we just have a conversation? And like, that's what I would, you know, I know that you have offered for our guests and thank you so much for this um, resource, but you have offered a free 30 minute consultation with people to chat about where they're at and where they might need some help and those types of things. And so I would encourage every listener to please take Michelle up on that. But like, that's basically what I did with this coach. I just said like, this is my experience that I'm living with the situation that I'm in with the person that I had selected, which was working really well for a while, but it's just no longer in alignment with where I'm at. Like I've done a lot of personal development and healing and, um, and I'm, my business has changed so much in the last year. I've really specialized and I just, I'm feeling just so drawn to you. Like I'm feeling like there's something there and like, maybe we shouldn't wait, but that's crazy, right? Like I'm already in a program and she's like, Raya, I'm about to start a group program. Like she has them periodically. And she's like, I really think you should be in it. And I was like, "Eh, I don't want to do a group program. And she was like, no, I really, and she gave me like her reasonings and, um, and it was like more, a a more reasonable price, you know, like for my budget and for all these things. And I think that we need to do more of that where we listen to our gut, like really listen to our gut and then say, when it's affirmative, say, okay, gut, is it affirmative because I really want this thing or is it affirmative because it's actually the right move? And we need to be in line, in alignment with our intuition, in alignment with what is right, because we are in business because we are innovators. We solve problems. We have a gut that tells us things, but we don't listen to our gut. Do you know what I mean? And so, you know, you need those, you need the pillars of wisdom around us. You know, the people in finance and business and things that have walked a couple steps ahead of us Mm -hmm. to tell us like, Hey, do you need that Apple music subscription when you have Amazon and Spotify? Like, I mean, do you use all of them? I mean, if you do awesome, cool, sweet, but do you need all of them? Actually? No, I do not. I do not need every single one. Thank you so much, Michelle. I forgot that I had that one. You know what I mean? Like (laughs) these are the things we're having that kind of support is so important. So I think that, you know, I, well, I think, first of all, I thank you for providing that opportunity. I mean, obviously it's not like a, a deep dive, but like for the people who, um, and also I didn't know that you guys specialize in cleanups. Like there's so many people. Oh my God. So many people are like, I'm scared. Like, I don't even want to deal with it because I have so many months to clean up. Well, we, I just had this conversation with somebody who had three years to clean up and we've done as many as, um, 13. Oh my God, Michelle. I know. I know. Right. But the, the, the thing that we do differently, um, is that we get people on support right now. Yeah. Yeah. And we clean up at the same time. At the same time. So that they're not making a mess while they're getting it cleaned yeah. up. Yeah. And a lot of bookkeepers will be like, no, no, I just start at the beginning and then I'll yes. clean up. And then, you know, uh, six months from now, we'll start cleaning up this year or whatever, right? Um, that doesn't, well, it, it'll work, but it just takes too long. We need to like stop this right now. And we put people on a monthly bookkeeping support package 
And we're also cleaning up the past. Now we have a system to do that so that it works, right? But um, it really is the most successful way to approach this. And I don't know, for some reason, we we seem to attract clients who, you know, need this. And I love that though. I mean, it's so, and it's such a special and niche market, but I'm, I'm telling you, I have like two people, like one in particular that I will be connecting you with after this call. (laughs) Um, But I know so many people who say like, I don't know how to get started because I just have been throwing receipts and like in a literal or a figurative box, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and, and it's a really common thing, right? They, yeah, they just absolutely. dig themselves absolutely. into a hole and they don't even know how to start getting out of it. So um, two things that I want to get in before we finish up. And number one is, oh, I love this so much. Like if somebody is like, I don't know even where to get started. I can't afford a bookkeeper. I don't know what to do. I am like, read the book profit first like just read it audible it i don't care how you consume it just like if if you can't afford and i'm putting these in quotation marks because i don't believe that there is an entrepreneur that can't afford a bookkeeper you there you have to find a way if you're in business to do that but if you're like maybe you haven't launched yet you know what i'm saying um and you're in the planning stages um profit first and you can explain it even more, but this is my like layman's terms is written by Mike McCallowitz, which you cannot spell his last name. So go to motorbikemike.com. Um, it, he talks about how um, it is important to take the profit off the top before you pay anything else. And um, he, um, and I've gone into this in other podcasts, but the um, the best like visual is my grandparents who were actually pretty affluent. I didn't know this at the time, but um, my grandfather was a retired pediatrician. My grandmother was um, a fashion designer who left her career to become a professional mom. And she was like a socialite and like the life of the party. I mean, there was a, so much pinochle going on at their house. It wasn't even funny. But their method of finances was they they took out from wherever, like their retirement or whatever, because they were both a lot older when they were older when they adopted my dad. And um, so they took out a certain lump sum every month and they had envelopes and they had a safe. And then they had like they would a little tray that would come out and then there was envelopes. And each envelope had handwriting on it. It was my grandmother's handwriting. And it was like clothes groceries um you know like they would pay with their checks like the mortgage and the you know whatever um but then my favorite of all times was the frolic fund because the frolic fund was for like let's go to the movies or let's go to go out to eat or it was like their date night or like let's take a grandchild to go do something fun Like it was the fun fund and they planned for it. Like every single thing had its place. And that's what Mike Michalowicz's profit first is for me. It's the envelope method. And he, I think even uses that um, analogy, but using bank accounts and, you know, without going into like all of the details because people get overwhelmed by it. Um, you know, tell me what, what prompted, cause you are um, a profit first certified, um, financial provider and like what motivated you to want to align yourself and your business with profit first and, um, you know, giving people kind of a taste of what that looks like from a bookkeeper standpoint, you know, like, and maybe educating people or, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, what I saw, um, I was so thankful to, to find Mike's book, um, And because what I was seeing was that uh, so many of these businesses were having problems with cash flow. They had revenue, but they were not managing cash flow. And if you look into the stats, um, the SBA has a a study out uh, last year, uh, which showed that uh, 10% of 
So 90% of new businesses fail within the first five years. Of the 10% that survive, like 9.95% of those businesses that survive are having cash flow problems. And so I was, and this is what I was seeing with, with clients, right? Like often what I came to know is that actual more revenue can actually stress a business uh, because more sales of a product, you've got to order more inventory. Yeah. So that eats up your cash flow. Yes. If you're a service-based business and you have a huge bump in revenue, then you actually either have to fulfill on the services or you have to hire people. So that takes up your cash flow. Yep, 100%. And so it was a hit to the cash flow all the time. And, And so I saw like lots of revenue, no cash in the bank. It, it was like this cycle they would get into. And the thing that I loved, which you talked about, was kind of like this idea of giving money a job, right? So removing from your cash flow um, an amount for tax, removing yes. an amount for payroll, right? Removing amount for inventory, if you carry inventory. Like take this out of your, your main flow of money, And what you're left with is what we call your operating expenses or your OPEX. And that is for the the everyday occurrences in your business and your your and your overhead. Right. Now it takes some navigation to figure out what these percentages are. And you have to have accurate records. Right. So it all kind of fits together like a big puzzle. But once you remove this, this cash and you've given it a job, it's actually there now when you need it. So a great example of this, I have, um, I had a, I was in a BNI chapter. I'm no longer in the chapter, but I was in the chapter for about three years, I think. I actually built my bookkeeping businesses off of the BNI chapter. And one of the um, members of the chapter, he um, said, hey, can I meet you for lunch? So I'm thinking it's like a B and I kind of get to know you kind of meeting. We had yeah. known each other for a couple of years and we're sitting at a, a table in a restaurant across from each other and he's, he starts to cry and he said, either I declare bankruptcy today or I, you fix this because I can't go on. My mental wow. health is suffering. My marriage is suffering. Everything is suffering and I can't do this anymore. And either wow. I close the door today and I declare bankruptcy or you, you're going to come in and you're going to rescue this. And I was just like, holy fuck, because I thought he had a lot of revenue. He had a lot of clients. I thought he had a pretty good business. So when I, I was like, okay, well, let me dive into your numbers and have a look. And I spent about four hours in his books that night and I saw he was just bleeding money. He was losing um, well, in the previous fiscal year, he'd lost $70,000. In the next, oh like that current fiscal year, he had lost $35,000, like year to date, right? Yeah. I was like, you can't keep doing this. Like, you're right. You're either going to declare bankruptcy or we're going to come in and we're going to fix it. So we did. We came in and we took over every financial aspect of his business. Like he just was like, hands off. And he gave us full reign. We, we eliminated staff. Unfortunately, he had people who were stealing from him, who were booking hours they didn't work. Like it was crazy. We cut, he, he had the assignment of renegotiating software costs. He was in IT. So he had, um, he had really expensive client management software. So I was like, I tasked him with this one task, go and renegotiate this fee. He managed to cut the cost from $1,100 a month to $300 a month. Oh my God. Right? And we just, we went through every single line item. Now, the awesomeness of this is when we started, I said to him, what would be the best result for you? He said, the best result would be next year that I get to go and take my wife to the Bahamas for a 25th wedding anniversary. And I already have the money for it. And so he did that right? Because we put profit first into place and he no longer had, like, it takes a while for everything to catch up. He no longer had any problem. He ended up selling his business last year for quite the tidy sum. Um, 
and he's now off doing something else. I love that. And you guys can know that when you've done this and, and I wanted to say too, it's very flexible. Like mm-hmm. I don't, and I know a lot of other people who love the profit first model, but don't follow it exactly to the T like you can modify it to what works best for you. So like for me personally, I have my OPEX account. I have a taxes account. I have an owner's comp account. I have, of course, my profit account. And then I have an SBA loan. And so I've created a a special account for my SBA loan because um, they just deposited it into a checking account for me. It's not like a a regular loan, but Mm -hmm. I wanted to see everything that came out of that specific loan so I could make sure I was tracking things. And the percentages are my, what I feel, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if you're feeling like you don't know where to get started, buy the book Profit First by Mike McCallowitz. Mike McCallowitz. Um, and if you can't spell his last name, I'm pretty sure he can't either. It's fine. Just put Profit First. <laughs> um, and then um, it's also available on Audible. And if it's overwhelming, it's okay. Just talk to Michelle. Get and some um, That's you how know, you gotta the, do. It's, it's just engage with somebody who knows how to make it work for you. And, um, you know, one of the things too about your business that I think is so special is that you are just like end to end, you know what I mean? Like that you can do the bookkeeping and the taxes that you can do, you know, like all of it, um, that, uh, you know, that's really unique as well. Um, so we're getting closer to the end. I do want to highlight a money dates. I think this is really important. And then I'll ask my two questions that I ask every person, But um, something that's new to me that I'm um, learning is CEO time, which is where I'm setting aside time each week to measure my KPIs. You know, like, um, did I do the things that I said, the goals that I set for this week? Um, Like right now I'm doing a LinkedIn campaign where I'm really um, just my first connections. Like I'm really trying to reach out and like make meaningful connection with people. Cause I, I can't remember, like, did I, re- did I reach out to them and connect with them? Did they connect with me? But we should like know each other. Um, but then part of it is finances, looking at my weekly P and L, like, what did I spend this week? What did the business spend this week? How much did we earn this week? You know, like just knowing what's happening in real time and then asking the person who's doing my books to say, hey, by Friday, I need to have this report. You know what I mean? Like, um, I need to have this. And you call it having a money date. So tell me about money dates. Yeah, so I agree. I have a CEO day for myself. And I learned that early on that I needed time to actually work in my business um, and, and look at my numbers and do some analysis and, and talk to the people who were working for me and all the things that I was, um, working on. And part of that process is what I call a money date. And that is, um, I ended up creating, uh, your money date journal, which you can get on Amazon if you need guidance on this, but, um, it's really a time for you to interact with your money. Because what I believe is that we we create a relationship with money. And that relationship starts when we're little, right? And and we we start, you know, we have our lemonade stand or we have our allowance or whatever it is, right? And and we we build that relationship. And sometimes that relationship becomes a little dysfunctional, right? And maybe it's not the healthiest relationship. For other people, it's a great relationship. For some people, it's like they don't even think about that relationship. Like, it's like, oh, I don't even worry about money. Um, And there's kind of like, there's not necessarily a, a right or wrong. I don't believe in a right or wrong. I just believe in a, like, is this supporting the life that you want to have, right? So if you're feeling overwhelmed or anxious or worried about money, then that's not going to be supporting the life that you want to have. And so you need to cultivate a better relationship. You need to heal any kind of shame story or um, guilt or uh, overwhelm that you're feeling about money. 
And by spending that time with your money and treating it like a date, like you were going out with somebody, like, like enjoy it, like, like make it fun. Um, I always tell clients, like, if you love candles, light a candle, have your most yummy coffee drink, uh, get dressed yes. up, feel like the CEO that you are, right? Wear have a your bubble crown. bath first, whatever you totally. need to do. <laughs> right? Like wear your crown. Okay. Like crowns up ladies, we're doing this. Right. And, and then have a place that you are tracking this information, that you are interacting with it. And so money date really is logging into your bank accounts, looking at your balances, looking at the what you've spent this week. Often people find money coming out of their account that they didn't even know was coming out of their account and fix any issues. It's also looking at your debt. So how much do you owe? What is the interest rate? What's the minimum payment? Like, what's your plan for that debt? I don't think that all debt is bad. There's um, there's reasons to go into debt. Are you being smart with it? Look at the money that's owed to you. So what clients owe you money? Does your brother owe you money? Does your friend owe you money? Do, are you waiting for a refund for a company? This is like you developing um, this integral like um, relationship with your finances, right? Uh, what money do you owe? So do you other people? Do you have payroll coming up? Do you have suppliers that you have to pay? Like, what do you owe? Who do you need to pay? Where is your money need to go? Look at, like we're looking at bank balances. If you're running profit first, you're looking at your allocation percentages and, and feel good about this process. There's no judgment. It doesn't matter if you've got 10 cents in your profit account. It, that doesn't matter. It's, it's the interaction that matters because what we, what we develop is a habitual pattern of behavior that we create with money. And so by, by interrupting that pattern, we can make incredible change. And it doesn't take long. But we, we can take the judgment and the shame out of it and feel good about it. Have it to be a good process. And this is not easy. If you have developed this dysfunctional relationship with money, this will not be easy for you to do. Like you may just need to... Um, look at one account, right? I have a client who we meet every Saturday and that's what we do for 15 minutes. She just needs me there to, so that she's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to log into my bank. Here I go. She's got lots of money in her bank, but she hasn't developed that confidence yet in that relationship. And so it's it, logging into her bank for many years was really stressful because it was always negative right? And she felt stupid. And she yeah. was in a relationship where she was told she was stupid. Right. She wasn't good with numbers and she wasn't good with money. Right. So she developed this whole belief. And so we're changing that through new habitual behavior, right? And, and that's the biggest, um, one of the biggest things that you can do in, in changing your wealth like I so strongly believe like if there's a mission in my life, it's to change the traject the generational trajectory of our wealth. And for me and my family, I'm a pivotal point that is changing the, tr the whole trajectory of wealth in my family. And that that's what we can do by creating a new relationship with money. I love, love, love it. Like, honestly, I really, really do. Because I think for me, and I've, and honest, like the exact words you're saying about money is, um, is the exact words that are used in the modality of healing that I've been used, using this year, um, which is core wound healing. And they're ta they talk about healing wounds. Some of them are money wounds. Yeah. Um, that have been passed down generation to generation and changing the trajectory of your own life. And by doing that, st 
stopping the chain, like stopping it with me. Like I I've said this to other people, but I've said it to my own daughter about a specific wound. I said, am I doing this to you? And she goes, sometimes. And I was like, okay, well this stops with me. She's like, it's okay, mom. I have boundaries. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, like, but I think, I think that that's so, so important. And, um, so before we go, there's two questions I want to ask you first, which we've covered amazing amount of material. This is this episode. I always say this, but I mean it like this episode is fire, like so important. Like if anyone wants to make wealth, keep their wealth, spend their wealth, live in rich and wealthy and joyful lives. And that's not all about money, but mm-hmm. in business, we need to be in charge of our money so that we can enjoy the rest of what we're actually working for. So what I would love to hear from you is if somebody was to come to you and say about this episode and say, I I only retained one thing, what would that one thing be that they walked away from this episode and they learned from you in this episode? Well, the one thing would be to get help. You can't do this alone. Now, help doesn't have to cost a lot of money, right? But if you could do this alone, you would have already done it. So get help. I love that. And then this is a question that doesn't have to have anything to do with anything that we're talking about. And I'm excited because uh, no pressure, but I love everything that's happening behind (laughs) you. Fuck average, be legendary, do epic shit, trust the process. You know, just like love your whole vibe and your roller derby, just like, everything about you, it just resonates with me. But what would you say is the most um, meaningful piece of advice that you've been given? And that can be from any source about any topic. Well, I got to say, and he's going to hate this, but this piece of advice comes from my uh, roller derby coach. Now I've not played roller derby for five years because I had a really severe ankle and leg break, but um My coach, he used to say, um, you go in there and you play hard and you give it everything you got until you you don't, you don't got any more. And if you end up in the penalty box, well, it was worth it. Fuck yes. And so for me, that piece of advice was so vital because I had lived a, a life where people told me it was too much right? Over the top. I was too much, too loud. You're not like a normal accountant. You don't fit in all this stuff. And when I started playing roller derby, like I'm, I'm five, 10 and a half. So you put me on roller skates. I'm over six feet tall. I'm not a small girl. Right. And I have a killer shoulder hit and I used to fall out. Like I would never make the end of a game because I'd foul out because for so many, I was too much. I was too strong. I was too aggressive. And he was like, he was, he was like, he gave me the the permission card to just go out there and give it everything you got. And if they can't handle it, that's their problem. Mm -hmm. And that's my approach to business as well. Is you go into your business, you go out there in the world, you give it everything you got. Because what else is there? Well, because then if you fail, like, you so what you Who gave it what you got like this yeah. is my favorite like so my favorite ted talk of all time is mel robbins stop screwing yourself over and she talks about the f word and she talks about how how the f word is so prevalent but it doesn't really add any value and she goes of course i'm talking about the word fine you know she's like <laughs> stop being fine she's like be colossally awful be fucking fantastic. Like, don't be fine because then you're just living in this in between. And that's what I get when you tell, when you tell me that it's like, put it all freaking out there because if you fail, make it freaking epic, go down in a blaze of freaking glory, because then at least you can say, I gave it everything I've got. I gave it every single thing that I've got and it didn't work out. Oh, well, you know, like, so let's clean up this mess and let's figure out what's next. You know what I mean? Maybe I go back to work. 
Maybe I start a new business. Maybe I declare bankruptcy, whatever it might be. But whatever. you you go out there and you give it your best. And I love that. If you end up in the penalty box, at least it was worth it. Yeah. You gave it everything you had. Oh, and, I love it. And I can say, honestly, I in my business, I have given it everything I've got. I continue to every day. I will give everything I have to my clients. Um, I will show up. I will do whatever it takes. Um both for them, for my team, for myself, for my family, for my friends. And I have no regrets of that. I love that. Well, just as a reminder to the audience in the show notes is the link to Michelle's schedule. Please, please, please do yourself a huge favor. Schedule a consultation with her. See if it's a good match. See if she... um could maybe be the answer to your problems. You never, ever know. Um, but I will tell you that she is legendary. She is amazing <laughs> and um, absolutely worth your time in checking things out because this, again, this is not a luxury. This is a necessity. We want wealth, guys. We got to bring it in. So this is the way that we do it. So throw on your crown, call Michelle, make it happen. But right. this has been a fun and wonderful episode of the Client Experience Revolution podcast. Thank you every week for being part of this podcast. You are so important to me. If you've not already joined the group, find us on Facebook. It's the Client Revolution podcast group. Um, I think it's just called the Client Experience Revolution. Yes, it is. Come join us. Have fun. We have fun conversation in there. Um, it's a networking group where we just do things a little bit differently. We just take no bullshit and we have fun. So um, we thank you again for joining us. Again, Raya Gonzalez, your host of the Client Experience Revolution podcast. And we will see you next time.